What does a beautiful future look like to you? You can flip a negative mood on its head. This was a talk that was all over the place, but then New York, you are all over the place. There are experiences that you just don't get anywhere else. Hey everyone, I am TV Guide Magazine's Damian Holbrook, and I would like to welcome you to the 92nd Street Wise virtual talk with Peacock's AP Bio. Uh, we've got Glenn Howerton, Patton Oswalt, Jean Villapeak, Mary Son, Lyric Lewis, Paula Pell, and creator Mike O'Brien. Now, uh, AP Bio returns for its third season on September 3rd on Peacock. So without further ado, uh, on behalf of 92nd Street Y and Peacock, let's enjoy a conversation with our crew here. You guys, congratulations. Thank you. Thank We're you. excited. So Thank you're canceled you. in May of 2019 <clears throat> and then renewed in July of 2019 by the same network that canceled you. But then you're... The Peacock, the first first scripted ordered show from Peacock. What did you guys do in between those two months? What was going on? Weeping, weeping. Just, yeah, just just crying. Uh, I mean, the show was uh, the show always did well in streaming. Uh, it was. Uh, I, I think our audience is just the kind of audience that streams stuff, mm -hmm. given the option. Um, they're not. They're just not a linear audience. Uh, so, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Um, and then I think Hulu was moving away from, uh, you know, picking up and making original shows, um, maybe just from Universal or whatever. And, you know, they were kind of moving away from, I mean, they got bought by mostly, uh, bought out mostly by Fox Disney. So they weren't really doing Universal stuff. So for a minute, we were just kind of in limbo until Peacock decided that they wanted to do original shows. Um, and once they made the decision that they were going to make original shows, you know, like you said, they, they, they picked us up very quickly because the show did actually do, I wish that was more the narrative that was out in the way in the press rather than that the show didn't do well and got canceled. Cause that's only half true. It didn't do yeah. well on NBC, but it did extraordinarily well on Hulu. So it made and sense. For Mike as the creator, like, what was that like for you seeing them say like, Oh no, we actually do want this. And can everyone come back together? Because I would imagine, like, once you're canceled, everyone starts looking for other jobs. Yeah. Um, I started writing a different pilot. I mean, you got to move on, you know. Um, but uh, there, there was a weird thing where they were like, um, don't, don't say anything about it. You guys are, are canceled, but um, be quiet about it. And I would recommend to any shows out there to ignore that because... Um, I tweeted about it and then Patton and these guys kind of started the whole save AP bio thing. And I thought that was just a really nice way to kind of thank everyone involved and was a little pessimistic about it actually working, but um, that was all a real thing. We were all kind of mourning it. And then, but yeah, like Glenn said, very hopeful because the, the 30 day numbers, I'm sure fans out there will love this type of stat. Uh, <laughs> We're, we're really good and, and we have a graph <laughs> right yeah <laughs> well now that you're on streaming what kind of new freedoms did you get in telling these stories mostly time I, all of season one and two are like 21 minutes and 12 seconds and three frames or something every single episode and now they were like you know try not to go over 25 minutes and uh so that was great uh, we we kept it um, definitely under 25 minutes, but there's that moment where you're like, I love both these jokes and this season we would keep both. And um, in seasons one and two, you'd cut something. So the show, it made a very big deal when it first started that this and Jack even had like, you know, the, the monologue of like, I'm not going to be teaching you something secretly. You're not going to change me all this. And you guys really stuck to it in the first two seasons. He is the tough pistachio to crack. Um, but this season definitely feels like Toledo gets under his skin. Was that kind of your goal to like maybe soften some edges on him? 
Uh, I would say from the beginning, I thought the goal was that he was warming up to Toledo and the, I mean, in the pilot, he like stands up for a kid who's being bullied and everything. So he, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe the fact that he's dating someone gives him a naturally softer feel. I don't know. Is that something you felt, Glenn? Yeah, uh, it is actually. And um, I mean, it was always important to me that uh, that really ultimately what I'm portraying as the as the series goes on is a man who uh, is really starting to like these people, but is terrified uh, of, you know, he always want he wants to be the Harvard Boston guy. Uh, and he's terrified of being the Toledo hometown guy. Um, and I think one of the most interesting things for me to play as an actor is this, is this constant tension between what I want to be and what I think I probably am, which is just a guy who loves his hometown, like, but would never want to admit it. Um, you know, so that, that tension, you know, I think is there. And then, and then, you know, honestly, like my genuine fondness for the cast uh, is, uh, is something that I use, um, you know, because I, I, I really, I really do like these, these human beings. So, uh, you know, anytime I'm, I'm a dick or I'm cynical, uh, towards them, um, you know, it's really just meant as a, as a sort of a defensive measure. So as not to get too close to people that I feel like I'm probably going to have to leave one day or something, you know what I mean? There's a lot of enmeshed love, enmeshed sort of dysfunctional love. There is, there is a deep sense of enmeshment within the the halls of Whitlock. (laughs) Something that I picked up this in in season three was also you explore a little bit more of Jack's relationship with his late mother, and then I started to think like, oh, he doesn't want to connect with these people because he still hasn't dealt with the loss of his mom. Mm-hmm. And going back to like, even with like the, the popcorn night and things like that. And thank you very much for the TV Guide magazine shout out. <laughs> in the episode. Really appreciated that. Um, but the way that the relationships that he has are evolving have been really fun to watch, especially in season three. And the stuff with Patton is honestly, they have, they've, they've gotten to that point of the oddest couple possible. <laughs> but my God, I need to see them on a road trip. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> the stuff that I get to do with Paula this season, there's an episode. Oh my where God. We fight over uh, of the, the same class ring lady. The yeah. class ring lady. My God. It is, it is so here's what's so weird. And, and this is, you know, Mike and the writing staff, it's genuinely heartfelt, but it's so cringy to watch <laughs> how these two damn, what, what these damaged people think, pursuing love looks like they're yeah. both so off the mark but in being yeah. off the mark they are actually being sincere watching I, I, their game in real time is excruciating for the viewer it's like uh, marjorie <laughs> marjorie marjorie <laughs> look marjorie <laughs> look look marjorie yeah. I, 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 re- I remember like reading the script before we did the tape read and i could i could hear Paula doing that whole, that, you know, basically it's like a little kid, like, look, look, look at me. Just no filter. It it made me laugh so hard. There's, there's definitely um, almost like the slow deterioration of Durbin's sanity this season, almost (laughs) between the class ring lady and the, um, the get hoppy episode. Yeah. Yeah. He is, he's a man still trying to find his place in the world, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, I think that it's weird. He's almost like the inverse of Jack, where Jack puts up this facade of, I'm too cool for this. Um, Durbin puts up the facade of, oh, no, I'm actually, I've totally accepted this and I'm okay with everything. And he's not. He's lying to himself just as much as Jack is, but just on a different level. So you see where that tension brings out the hilarity and the insanity. Well, I never actually thought of it that way. He is. The reverse of Jack, he's lying. He's lying about how he is settled and is zen with everything, and he's absolutely not. Interesting. And and it really is like everyone loves Durbin. Everyone loves Durbin. Like Helen will honestly, there are two people Helen would take a bullet for, yeah. and Durbin is one of them. And yeah. even the, the teachers, which I just the muses, they ride him so much and they get like they they take their jazz, but you guys really, really appreciate him as a principal, it seems. Yeah. He's he's their little brother and they know exactly how far 
to push them. And in the, the three of them have a sister's dynamic where Jean is kind of the more flighty artistic one. And, mm -hmm. and it's there, it, there is such an amazing family dynamic just, just between the three of them and then how they interact with Durbin. It's fantastic. I think we also respect, we don't respect him so much uh, uh, for how he does his job, but we love him. And as much as we will manipulate him to get what we want, we would mm -hmm. send him to anyone mm -hmm. else because he's our family in that yeah. unhealthy and meshed love way. <laughs> Oh yeah, they, almost, it's almost like the teacher's energy is, hey, no, 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 we're the ones who tease him, not you. Right, right. We yeah. are the ones who will do this. You back off. Yeah, and you turn around and defend him, but, but you, when you're alone with him, you're the older sisters just really, yes. really hit him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if you have done, because all of these episodes, like the first two seasons, you can stream on Peacock for free already. And, and I would suggest everyone do before the third season, because you do leave with a cliffhanger at season two. Yes. Um, but as you start to watch and you start to notice Steph, Mary, and Michelle, they may actually be worse teachers than Jack. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. They're actually menaces to the student body. Yeah, at least Jack's honest. Yeah. I think the teachers are teaching real life skills. I there think you go. that Steph and Mary are truth speakers. They are not afraid to be honest to anybody, which is why they're so wonderful and funny. And they also are really direct with their kids. So it's not your classic uh, idea of what a teacher is, but I think they're teaching them how to behave as adults in the future. Uh -huh. The teachers that oh, you remember, course. you remember yeah. when you yeah. committed yeah. a crime and you need someone to blame or in the therapist. Well, that's, that's <laughs> the thing. I think with these three, like, they would definitely help each other bury the body, but I feel like Michelle would forget where the body was buried. <laughs> and for good like every single person in this series would help each other bury the body. I mean, that'll probably be an episode next season. Yeah. Yeah. And the lyric, your character comes in and we pick up from a cliffhanger <laughs> where your character is suddenly nine months pregnant. Very pregnant. Yes. The cliffhanger. And then she is booming. Yeah. yeah. And still not exactly sure if she's 100% pregnant. Yeah. Still, still. She yeah. has to take a test very often just to make sure that that's what that is. And it's not some gas from all the fruit they eat. And then like <laughs> <laughs> mass tracked it. Uh. And there is, and you guys, you guys finally, because I loved the, the, the lunchroom or the, the, the teacher's lounge sequences. Yeah. Like it felt like season one, they were never in a classroom. They were only at that table. Yeah. But now you guys are out and about in the school. And this is the season that you have to walk around being pregnant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, I will say it was sit down. so fun. I mean, I tried to sit down as much as I could, but it was so fun just to be able to, in real time, like in real life, share that in my real life and on set with the cast and like with Steph Duncan and to, you know, transform into her as being pregnant and like what she would do. And I feel like Steph would be just as much in everybody's business as out and about oh, yeah. with a gut full of human <laughs> walking around. <laughs> just, you know what I mean? Like, yes, that line, <laughs> oh, the legs are growing. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, it was definitely... <laughs> <laughs> one, day, one day I was like, I'm getting her a zero gravity chair. We're getting her a zero. And I went yeah. on Amazon and I was just like trying to find the best zero gravity chair. And all of a sudden someone in the crew went, oh, we have one for her already. And they carried it out. I was like, now that nice. is. That now that's something I'd also like to see Helen in is a zero gravity chair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Helen would immediately yeah. flip it the other way. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's there's a storyline that comes up in, this, in the new season where the three teachers um, are divided a little bit, where there's uh -huh. the young entrepreneurs and you, you're mm -hmm. split on which program. What is it like for you guys? Because you work so much together when you're not working together. Do you feel like any weird disloyalty? We not miss each loyalty. other. But we miss each other. I think even at the table read, like when we saw that it was like a moment of like, oh, <laughs> like right away because yeah we until we come back together it is a little like like what time do you get to work today like where are you <laughs> at? still going to see each other shoot each other's scenes taking pictures of one another on the monitor like still like no life well right. that that episode was also so discombobulating because not only were we separate but glenn was our director so it was like yeah. oh, oh. 
Oh. I don't know you in this capacity. And so it was all a little. <laughs> all a little. I, that, I, I love that episode because you got a chance to see again how the three teachers uh, interact with their students. And you see that they're maybe not the best. Te- like you saw a little bit of that in season one. I'll never forget the way Lyric is describing the destruction of Pompeii, but she's <laughs> describing it the way that you would gossip about something at a bar <laughs> to a bunch of friends. It's like she said, you're not going to believe this shit that went down. Like it was, <laughs> so you see that, but again, like Paula said, you would actually remember those teachers more than the ones that just give you right. that knowledge. Right. It was great. Um, and also, and Mike, it's a brilliant idea to basically position the three of them also very much like reality show judges because <laughs> they do it twice in season three where they get to judge like the young entrepreneurs and then the rummage sale. And I feel like yes. if that like if that continues, we are like the amount of super cuts that will end up on YouTube of these three just reading people would be amazing. Yeah, and, and trying to set them up for work after the... A- AP bio, you know, they should be judges on something, I think, but, um, yes, but yeah, that's, it's always, it's, there's so many amazing actors and, and characters to service that at some point in the writer's room, we're always like, is there just like something that's like barely a story and it just kind of lets, uh, Mary Lyric and Jean say jokes and, uh, it kind of looks like a story, but like to have three big story arcs is, uh, kind of hard. Um, and mostly what you want is just them doing bits. So I think I like when they come hard at, at Jack, I just love when they really rip him to shreds on something and he's just, you know, a little bit discombobulated. Mm-hmm. Cause he's really, he's, he's probably the only one who could take their ribbing. Yeah. Yeah. But they're not afraid of him. They're not afraid no. to like go there and make fun of his pants. And I love that. Yeah, where Durbin and Helen are are respectful. I think that the teachers are like, Harvard, who cares? Who cares? You know, so right. piss out of him and yeah. he's not sure how to handle that. I think that's you can that's where you can also see a little bit of like the the Jack warmness too, is that you know, normally if somebody were to diss him or, you know, try to make him feel small. Right. would go on the offensive and, you know, become hyper intellectual and sort of try to destroy the person, you know, but with these three, he, he, he kind of, he kind of loves it. He kind of loves it. I think he likes, he would never, again, he'd never admit it, but I think he likes that they ground him. Yeah. And they come through for him in a certain episode this season where it's a really lovely wrapped around like a terrible situation. <laughs> <laughs> but where they where they basically rally for you in your uh, time of need at the doctors. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I, I wasn't. I couldn't remember what you were talking about for a second. There. I was like, what is, "What's he talking about?" Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. that was that was uh, that was a fun one. I love that now, episode too. That has that Mary quality of like immediately with Jack is trying to be serious. She's like, "Whoa!" Like you will not take him seriously for a second, and it's so endearing. It's so fun. Yeah. Okay, so now let's talk about Paula Pell, who somehow and finally has become not only like one of our top physical comedians on television, but also one of the hardest working people in Hollywood right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's mm-hmm. that's also when we're talking about Patton Oswalt, who is literally everywhere this year. That is true. I am killing it in shutdown Hollywood right yeah, now. Honestly, the two of you are showing how to hustle. Um, Pat, you did like, you have this, you had, I'll be gone in the dark, which was astounding. You show up for like a hot second in The Boys. You had the Netflix special. Right. I mean, take, leave a job for some other people. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I managed to, to squeeze a lot of stuff in before the shutdown. So I yeah. was very, very lucky in that, in that sense. But, uh, Look, I like doing stuff. I get excited for stuff. I was a huge fan of the first season of The Boys and I tweeted about it. So they asked, I can't say what I do on it, but yeah. like there's just stuff that, and, and I'm, I'm a fan of the industry I'm in. I like watching stuff that other people do. I don't necessarily have to be in it, but I'm glad that it exists because I also like watching good stuff. So, you know, I, I was a fan of Mike O'Brien's work and Glenn Howerton's work. So when this came along, I'm like, oh, yes, I get to work. It's just I just I'm in this for the money and the anecdotes. That's what I want. I want <laughs> it's just a lot of money. So if you look, if you if you go at it that way, you always get to do cool stuff. 
Well, I then, love then, watching. You, I love watching Pat and love things. Like it's right? it's it's so genuine. And I went. I went. My uh, fiance and I went to dinner with uh, Pat and his lovely wife, and to our favorite restaurant. And it was like watching him experience oh our favorite oh. restaurant food in the way that we were dreaming that he would experience it. And he was like, Oh my God. That you know, and, and I feel like when this happened with our, with our show, it, you know, it, he was the same way. He was like on there, just on there going, we love this. This is a great show. You yeah. guys love this show. Like he, he's, he's a great um, guardian of joy. And, so, and you are, I mean, you, you have so many things going on. You're writing like three movies, you have the Quibi show, which you got patent on. I'm writing three uh, movies? I don't know about those others. You should check your IMDb page because you are going to be busy this year. Yeah. Um, you've got so much going on and, and you were, you were you know, cameos almost in season one. And I remember talking to Seth Meyers and Mike Shoemaker and I was like, you guys need to get her on board. Ah, yeah. And now you get full storylines now. Like you're everywhere. What's your Venmo, Damien? So I'll just say, <laughs> yeah. How is that? I mean, and because Helen's such a lovable character and, and you get some incredible physical comedy to do this season. That, that is not easy. It's so much fun. And I always love to do as much as I possibly can fit because I hate when there's that comedy rhythm to something and then you see the stunt and, and it just cuts away and it's completely like disconnected because it's mm -hmm. a stunt person. And I'm not going to lie. I have a stunt person that comes in for things like swinging around a giant canoe or something that I can't physically do. But I love, I love things that I get to dive onto a big mattress or something jumping out of frame. I like it to be my face. So it feels real, you know, to the character, but the it's so much fun. We're the Tom Cruise of our show. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> and the greatest is like, even in the first episode back when you have a, a situation surrounded by miniatures, I love that Jack. <laughs> Jack what I love about only... that episode so much is that because I'm in gone back to high school, you know, it's like he can't Jack can't pull his typical shit because he I find out. And I'm infiltrate. I've, I've embedded, you know. Yeah. And so now I now I just make him like I feel like a mom that's like, you called that boy a butt. Okay, we're going back there. We're going back to his house, and you're going to tell him he's not a butt. <laughs> <laughs> I really, I really take his hand, and we go back there at night, and it's like you're going to fix this. I, the the scene uh, with the miniatures where where Helen does her most destruction, how much time how many takes did you get for that? It was a it was a long night. There was a lot of stuff and and so many of those miniatures, if I believe were all handmade, right Mike like because they were there just doing this masterful stuff for hours because it was a lot of breakaway stuff. So there was a lot of choreography to it and it was a lot of fun to shoot with Glenn, but it was a night shoot on the back lot there. And, and it's, it's fun to destroy things. I wish we all had a, a miniatures store right now that we could just go. Just tear through. There. Now, something that people always ask, you know, especially when it's a comedy, um, how much is improvised? But there are things, and because always people are like, it's always on the page, and blah, blah, blah. But there are moments in this that I swear to God, they, I mean, they just feel like they come from just a last minute moment that happened on screen. Like with, with uh, Michelle screaming in the pistachio episode of like, we will consume your power. Like, is there a lot of, especially because you have people who have all that improv background, is there a lot going on? Uh, I mean, I, I would talk, I would call it, I mean, it really is more ad-libbing than mm -hmm. improvising. Um, but honestly, like that line was scripted. That one that you just said, uh, that line was scripted. Um, you know, I mean, I, I my, my, my feeling is always like, I have no, I have no ego about it. It's like my, my whole thing is like, whatever's the funniest line. Like, so if the funniest thing that I, if the funniest thing that I can think of is what's written on the page, then I'm just going to say that, you know, if I can think of like some funnier shit, then I'll just, uh, I'll at least do one or two takes where I, you know, but usually it's some variation of the line that's already been written. It's not, it's, it's very rarely, it's very rare that I, I just like, you know, say a sentence that was nowhere in the, I mean, I guess every once in a while, but, uh, yeah. 
I think I, the real gift of having great scripts that we get handed and we go to those table reads and we're just like, oh my God, there's so many good jokes already. And you don't feel that anxiousness of like, I gotta, I gotta polish this turd. You know, you don't feel that at all because it's already a jewel. And so towards the very end, usually is when we're getting silly and we're on the last couple takes, you throw things, you know, throw things in. Yeah. And sometimes you can, sometimes you can beat it and you can find something amazing. And uh, oftentimes there's nothing better than the, than the line that's already been written. <laughs> also a lot of the writers come from improv um, right. and Mike can speak to that much more, but I think they have the, it has the feeling of improvisation because they have that spirit to their writing. So yeah. they get yes. it for sure. Yeah. That's yeah. such a good point. That's exactly right. And th this cast, I was going to say, I do feel like when normally a lot of projects I've been a part of, when you're like, if you guys want to do a fun, looser take, all the actors drop character and are suddenly a new, filthy weirdo. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're like, well, we can't use that because that would never, no one, we have this character already. And these guys really do it within the character, within the jokes that are kind of already happening. I think my, favorite one that I always have in my head from this season is that um, Helen doesn't know what ska music is. And <laughs> so when she sees a guy dressed up in as a ska fan and he says, I'm ska, she thinks he's saying I'm scared, like in kind of Nell speak, I guess. And um, that's God, true. And then but there's a callback that Paula did later where she says, I'm so ska. <laughs> and that I was improvised but it fits within the what was happening with the characters and the uh, episode already it's the same game right right exactly comedy so technical terms it's the same talking game. about talking about like comedy background so gene mary lyric you guys all come from you know the groundlings ucb and second city how do those kind of like modalities work together I think they work together very well. Like, um, even though, you know, Second City and the Groundlings has like kind of different schools of thought when it comes to improv and how they, you know, get into it. Um, it works They, I feel like they're completely complementary to each other. And, you know, I feel like, you know, what we three each bring to the table, especially when we have scenes with each other, I feel like I'm constantly getting to sharpen my knife alongside of them um with you know the improv you know just all the skills building with each other so and it is because it's like the training i mean clearly when you watch these you three together it's like okay there is an energy that these three have where you could drop them into the middle of any scene and they would be business in the background cracking us up Yes, it, it, yeah. the, the comfort, the com I, like I'm always because I don't come from a I, I never studied improv or trained with improv. So I, I'm always so blown away by uh, people that are so incredibly good at it. It's just like they're so like, like the three of them, like Gene, uh, Lyric and Mary are just so comfortable. Um, it, it just improvise. They're so comfortable with each other and they're so comfortable not like with the idea of not knowing what's going to come out of their mouths. Like, I, I, I love that. that. That's when it gets really fun. When you, when you get the sense that you're working with somebody who's like, just going to say whatever they think is the funniest thing. And they're not even, cause they, they're smart enough to know that it like, even if they blow it, it doesn't matter. And even that will be funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, that's so nice. And also I think this, that what is essential to improvisation is, playing, making your partner look good or making other people look good and supporting mm -hmm. each other in this sense of playfulness. So I think that feeds in, regardless of where we train, we're all climbing the same mountain. It's the same sport or whatever metaphor, but um, I think that's playfulness. We're just ready to play. It's such a good, no, that's such a good point. I, I think that is something that people forget oftentimes that is so important is like, you got to know, you know, you, you're a, you're like a basketball team. You know what I mean? Like you mm -hmm. got to know what the strengths and weaknesses of it, like, I mean, for me, uh, half the fun of improvising is like saying something that I know is going to elicit something funny from the person mm -hmm. I'm in the scene with. It's like, yeah. I'm just teeing yeah. up. It's like, that's that's a big part of it. It's just teeing the other person up. Just like, <laughs> Scotty Pippen. You know, I know they're oh, going to say some shit if I say this, you know, like. Yeah. I feel like when you get older and wiser in comedy, um, everyone please lean in and listen to this. <laughs> um, but I, I I do. <laughs> and then I forgot what I was going to say. I'm <laughs> and my brain is like Alpine lace, Swiss cheese. But um, no, I think that 
there is that filter you grow in your comedy where when you're younger, you just want to get a, you want to get a laugh. You're a clown and you want to get a laugh in a scene. And when I look back on things that I've done when I was younger, where I was like, you know, just go off and throwing everything at it, trying to do all this funny stuff. And I feel like the nice thing about being uh, in it for a while is you have, you do have that little bit of voice in you of going, that would be funny, but do we need it? Like, like you're saying, Glenn, like this, this scene ends perfectly hilarious and it's great. And we don't need this other thing that I'm going to throw into it that might like, yeah, we could, we could go down that road and try that, but like, we don't need it. And that's a great thing about getting all these funny scripts because you just don't have that anxiousness that you do sometimes with things where you're like, Oh, this, I, I just want to make this funnier. Yeah. Um, but I do have to ask again, this is one of those things where like, everyone's like, everyone's the professional on set, but Paula, when you and Patton are doing those scenes where Helen is just like pouring out her adoration for this man, um, or, or Pat, whereas Patton is like, he's got his tie stuck in the, tre- the, the, the shredder. What is the crew doing during this? Because I can't imagine some of them being able to maintain silence. <clears throat> well, we all get the giggles. I mean, Pat and I get the giggles sometimes really bad. There's a moment in this season, I, I, I hope that they saved all the takes, but where the janitor has to come in. Um, oh. uh, Brent, who plays the janitor? Brendan. Uh, Brendan. Brendan. Yes. Yes. Brendan Jennings. And he comes into the teacher's lounge and he, and he confronts Jack and says, hey, what's your problem, buddy? And the way he says that line, I think, Glenn, did you, we, we did it like 12 takes of that scene. <laughs> It was when he says, uh, no, he says, oh, shit. What was the line that he said? Where it, I uh, thought it was, well, hey, what's your problem, problem. buddy? Why'd you pop me? Is this about Jody? And, yeah, but then he's, it's the, I feel like it was the line that he says after that. that oh, and he's like, he's like something about like something Einstein. Yeah. Or, yeah. Whatever it was. Oh, yeah. it just, he goes, oh, do, 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 Einstein or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like, how about we, a rat with the rats? Fact that we had to be serious for this setup line. We first you lost it, and then we and we're and it was there was a couple moments where like are we just not going to get this si-? like it was so we could not stop laughing. Also, okay. Glenn is a tough nut to to get. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. So when when yeah. he goes, he he kind of is broken. There for a while. <laughs> well, um, speaking of the janitor, you expand this, the the universe of Whitlock High a yes. lot in the second season. This season, we meet even more people. Uh, yeah. We've got like. You got Dale the janitor, Coach Dick, Joyce the homewrecker. Um, yep. And then you even like added a couple characters. So you're really expansive and you, Dave gets so much play this season. Um, mm-hmm. What was the idea going into this new season of like new availabilities and new stuff that you got to do? Well, just get, get a feel for, you know, what do... What does someone like Durbin, I think you got to feel for that in Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. in season two. What does, what are all the interconnections between these people? And then what is, so, so when it seems like Jack is this massive thing in Durbin's life, actually Durbin has nine massive things he's got to deal with. And everyone else thinks that they're the center of it. You know, like the janitor thinks this is my story going on here. Mm-hmm. Geology Dave thinks this is my story. So to see all of that, to, to amp up all those characters, you get, it just makes it so much more dynamic when they're bouncing off each other like that. No one in real life thinks they're the B story. No. You know? That's just not, <laughs> yeah. not happening. And the kids, this is one of my favorite things is that the kids, the students, they are no longer the victims of Jack's oh, grumpiness. No. Mm-hmm. They're either his like partners in crime or his sparring partners. These kids are growing into like they're good allies. They're using him like yes. And a couple of them, the tables have started to turn. Yeah. And this is have you ever considered, Mike, to do an entire episode of the kids outside of school? Um. Well, we we had one where they were all at a house party. There, there's a little bit of those. Um. But yeah, um, they they've been great, and and just jumping back uh, to the the supporting cast, there's a really fun thing we try to do when we can. Where um, I don't know if this is a term, but we sort of overcast. So um, 
we were looking for a janitor in season one. We already had Brendan, but then we got Ron Funches to come do like four lines. And what we tell them is we're like, then you're in Whitlock forever. And we're going to try to have you back over and over. And um, so he did come back in, in a big role in season three, because he's already established in that world. It's great. And there's security guards and um, Dave Gabori from Gary Meets Dave are some of the funniest people I've ever worked with. And they've only said one or two lines so far. And But we, we have their headshot on the wall and we're like, maybe should, should we get this person back if we can get them? And and we end up with some really funny people doing smallish parts at first, knowing they might come back. Yeah, I, I also just I, it's important to me that I like I love that that's what makes part it's partially what makes the show unpredictable, which I think is really important too. It's like you never you, you don't expect that there's going to be an episode where Ron Funch's character is <laughs> so prominent, you know what I mean? And, and and so I love that he's created a world that is expansive in that way. So you never know whose story you're going to be following. Well, and, and following up on that, um, and thank you for teeing this up. Um, this season, you have two incredibly unexpected episodes that are almost like experimental. Um, your previously on episode is inspired. Like that is such a brilliant way to tell story. Um, and then Jack's, um, I guess it's like the dark night of Jack's soul <laughs> <laughs> with the, one of the largest bag of spaghetti. <laughs> Oh God! Um, do you could you imagine getting to do these on like standard broadcast network? I, it's a good question. I mean, a part of what uh, it might be partly that we were on streaming that we started experimenting more with the form, but it was also that we're I think getting better at writing and also more antsy. Um, so I'm not sure what would happen. The um, the network wasn't necessarily, they just would push back in surprising ways. So I, they were really hard to predict what they would say, like, oh, you can't do that. But they were fine with other things. Now I'm remembering that Wednesday morning, 8 a.m. kind of had an uphill battle. So, yeah, it might have been hard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I want to get to some some viewer questions, fan questions. But before we get to that, your Katie Holmes episode is... By far the greatest holiday episode ever. Um, and this, I mean, I love a Christmas special. I love a holiday. The Katie Holmes Day is, I wish this was a real thing. Um, where did this come from? And who was in charge of researching Katie Holmes' career yeah. and private life at, in Toledo? <laughs> Can I just say, and I'm not going to spoil anything, there are throwaway jokes in the Katie Holmes special that laid me out. They don't even have to do with the main plot about other. I'll just let you... I'm not going to say uh -huh. what there are little throwaway jokes now to the side. That's how good that episode was. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. God. Well, at, growing up in going to school, Catholic schools in Toledo, it's like almost a real thing. Katie Holmes was revered. She was uh, two grades below me at my sister's school. And um, we were all very aware when she got Dawson's Creek, we were all aware of the story that she self-taped it in her basement because she was doing our high school musicals. And it's like... <laughs> kind of legendary there there isn't an actual holiday but our hope is now that there will be and, and so we got to make up everything we made up green and gold instead of red and green and all these things that if people watch and they pause and they look at the d background um toledoans out there i think should pick an arbitrary day maybe katie's birthday or something and um make this real and you really worked out what all the little details of that holiday would be like you get a sense of how the day is supposed to go mm -hmm. Like, it, oh, oh yeah, God. and the fact that there's Katie Holmes Eve, yeah, so we even <laughs> have a celebration of the Eve. Um, I just, I, I watched that episode back to back because I, I was, I was trying to find like all the sight gags because there are certain things from like the Katie Holmes Uber that you really just really nail. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I cannot wait for people to see this, and I'm so grateful that there's some shows that you like to get like one episode at a time, but this one, when you consume all season three at the same time, you really feel like you just spent a semester with these people. Um, <laughs> I had a couple so of moments cause I wasn't, I'm too old for Katie. I didn't really <laughs> watch Katie Holmes that much in, in that show. So uh, there were a couple of times where I was like, wait, what, what, what did she do in that? What did she do in that show? Cause I'm so, I mean, you should have done it about Maury Amsterdam. <laughs> 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 oh, I got some fan questions um, uh, at Sunny and Draws. 
Uh, this is Danielle. She says, is there anyone you would like to uh, see guest star on the show? Uh, ton tons of people. Do you guys have, this is, this is a good time for you guys to pitch some friends to me. <laughs> well, that's, uh, that's you know, he, that guy never. My fiance is real funny. <laughs> yes. He's gonna kill me. I said that. So I was gonna um, kill me. I would. I mean, yeah. The, God, there are so many that. I mean, I. This is just my own personal because of people that I like, but like Andy Daly, Lauren Lapkus, or Maria Bamford would all be incredible um, on the show. Um, I mean, I'm sure that that. Mary and Lyric and Jean have so many people they know that would just be incredible. Idris Elba. Uh -huh. yes. Yes. Idris yes. Elba. Who is that? <laughs> Friend. Oh, okay. Friend. Mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> what, right, uh, what if you finally see my girlfriend in the show and it's just Idris Elba and we never call it out? We never <laughs> say it. Never. That's the thing. That's outfit. I've always um, called oh, him, you know, a fence jumper that I would jump over the fence for Idris Elba. <laughs> yeah. We all have at least one. We all, all right. have at least one. Um, okay, so Sam at, uh, at Sketch Goat, if you could switch roles with anyone on the show, who would you switch with and why? I, oh. I, I, I would switch with, uh, well, I, I would switch with Patton. Um, just because it's, so, it's, it is, because it is the polar opposite of, yeah. of my character and uh, it would just be so fun to do something comedic uh, where I'm not playing a narcissistic asshole. <laughs> Oh my God. I think I would switch with Paula because I would love to get physical and jump, fall through some windows and fall on some tables and have some, like, I would, yes. Like, I think it would be so fun just to, yeah. I would love to switch with um, geology Dave because he just is constantly getting clowned on. And I feel like all three teachers are pretty self-possessed, but I'd love to experience just someone going in on my ass. Throwing a sloppy Joe on your face, okay? There's a scene. There's a scene with him in a wheelchair that I won't give away. That's just oh. so <laughs> brutal and dismissive. It, oh my god! All right, go ahead, Glenn. Well, I was just gonna say, Patton. Uh, there, there, you know, in in the, there's one episode this year, get the Get Hoppy episode, uh, where Patton, where uh, Principal Durbin does get kind of narcissistic and uh, yes. of himself. Mm -hmm. and I had so much fun watching Patton uh, act that way that. If I may, I would say I would like for I would like to see Patton play Jack. Wow! Uh, because it was because I'm never I'm not used to, I'm not accustomed to see I'm not yeah I've never I haven't seen every single thing you've done Patton but I've seen a lot of stuff, um, and I'm not really accustomed to seeing you play like narcissistic assholes like and it was really fun like I I think you're. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to get, I would love to switch places and play just because also the Jack character that the way it's written and Glenn just, it, it's such a fine line between, yes, he is a narcissistic asshole. And then there's this weird, it's like he's infected with a conscience and every now and then it flares up <laughs> almost like a, like a virus and he has to like fight it off. It's yeah. it, the way he plays that is so there's a, there's a, again, there's a moment in season one where all the kids are morally objecting to something that he has proposed. And he goes, the way that he goes, what's going on here. He's genuinely confused and also a little scared. Mm -hmm. And that always, because he can't like watching a guy's conscience awaken and he's trying to beat it down is just <laughs> mm, love it. Love it. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you've all been asked this at some point, but if you had a teacher like Jack when you were in high school, how would you have handled it? I would have been ecstatic. Are you kidding? I would have gone, <laughs> tell me, give me the cheat codes for life. You clearly know something. <laughs> like, what am I, what actual book should I be reading? What am I supposed to be doing? Be awesome. I would love the access to an adult like that. Like, yes. I, I always loved it, having sort of relationships with the adults in my school and all that, having kind of our own little private jokes and everything. I would, I would love knowing the secret with him of like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very perverted in high school. So I think I'd be like, Gah! because hundred years old. So you would have not obeyed your glurst, Mary? Is that what I would have? Uh, first things first, I have to obey. Obey Mary. your glurst? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> obey your glurst. 
All right. Well, I need to wrap you guys. So I want to thank you so much. I want to congratulate you on an incredible season and the like the actual just renewal because this was this was such a gem of a show and to see it picked up and saved and come back and be so good. Um, I'm just so happy for all of you. I want to thank 92nd Street Y and Peacock. And don't forget, you guys, that AP Bio Season 3 drops on Peacock Thursday, September 3rd. All episodes of Seasons 1 and 2 are available for streaming now on Peacock. And, uh, yeah, so you guys can watch and rewatch and get ready for September 3rd. Thank you guys again so much. Thank you. Thank you. Love you guys. Mwah.